Det vill jag ju. Det vill jag ju. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. And I would like for you to all stand as we sing our call to worship, My Life is in You, Lord. And if you stand, you can kind of tap your foot because this is a pippy one. <clears throat> I think vacation time has hit, and I think maybe about three-fourths of our church has gone on vacation this week, but nevertheless, we're here, so we're going to enjoy some time together with the Lord, and, and I hope that uh, you will be blessed as a result of, of uh, our worship experience today. Uh, just a couple of very quick announcements before we uh, continue uh, our service, I pray, and continue our service. The ladies' Bible study will not meet tonight. And uh, there will be no choir practice this afternoon. And also, uh, the men's Bible study will meet this evening at 6. So just keep that in mind. Even though the ladies are not meeting tonight, the men will be meeting. So let us go to the Lord in prayer as we uh, continue our service. Father, today we are so grateful, so humbled to be in your presence with other believers. And as we come together, we pray that you will open our hearts and minds to be receptive and also that we will pour our hearts out to you in genuine, unadulterated worship. For whatever it may be in our minds and hearts today that is distracting us or possibly could distract us from focusing on you, I pray that you will remove it from our hearts and allow us, enable us, empower us to give you our undivided attention. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh! 
we're going to sing, He Hideth My Soul. <clears throat>
I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to look specifically at verse 6, but I'm going to refer to some other verses in the chapter, and, and today we're going to talk about five facts about faith. And it's not just a sermon to tell you what the definition of faith is. This is not what this is about. But it is uh, hopefully to demonstrate the importance of faith in your life and your walk with Christ as well as in my life. And so it's, it's an important aspect of, of Christianity. As a matter of fact, it's very critical in Christianity. And I, I'd like to read with you and then we, uh, for you, and then we're going to pray. And uh, we're going to be in, like I said, Hebrews chapter 11. It will be on the screen behind me. Just one verse. I will make some references. And it says this in verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek 
him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to bow our heads before you today. We thank you for the boldness that you've given us to come before the throne of grace. We thank you for the means you have provided for us to be able to do that through the blood of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And I pray today, Father, that you will take this message, that you will use it in some way or another to touch someone's life. I pray that you will uh, increase and that I will decrease, that your spirit will just take over and do great things in the lives of everyone. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. As we look at this, I, I want to say that faith is a foundational uh, aspect of Christianity. It is faith that builds on the work of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus died for our salvation, but without faith, we cannot be saved. So salvation comes by our faith, believing in God. We know that uh, if you look at Hebrews, it's very clear in chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, Faith is the substance of, of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith means sometimes that we walk kind of blindly in, in this world, uh, we listen to the voice of Christ. I don't know if you've ever walked in the darkness and heard voices before, uh, specifically someone that is uh, calling out to you and you're trying to find your way through the darkness to that voice. It's one thing not to be able to see it, but it's another thing to be able to hear it. I've done that before, and uh, it's kind of a unique thing. We've done that with a group of, of teenagers one time, and, and it was a, a unique aspect. And I'll have to say that we also... Uh, this wasn't my plan, but we stood on a platform and fell backwards into the arms of other, of other people. Now, I want you to know I didn't have a lot of faith standing on that platform and falling back into the arms of people who were about half my size. No offense by that, but, but I just didn't because I, I was doing some math there. My weight, their size, and so it just didn't correspond with me. But you know what? I did it, and I discovered something very important. If you stop trusting in the logical aspect of things and you start allowing things to just happen the way God intends them, it will, it will happen. And the reason I didn't hit the ground was because I stayed stiff as a board, as they told me, and I fell back, and I was calculating the weight of one individual while it was eight individuals there. And so you multiply that out if you want to do logic, and you, it just balanced out. It all worked out, and it demonstrated a very, very important uh, part of faith. Sometimes we can't see how it's going to work out, and we think it's going to be bad, but it may turn out completely different from the way we expect it to. When we think about uh, this sermon, we think about faith, my goal for this sermon is to challenge you in your faith. Now, when I say that, uh, ultimately God will challenge you in your faith. Ultimately, he's the one that will do that. He will grow you in your faith, and it's something you should know that you already know, is that, that faith does not uh, just come very easily. It's something that is, that is earned. It's something that grows. It's like exercise. Uh, it often is very difficult to, to experience, but the results of the exercise has benefits to it, and you exercise your faith. And so uh, that in itself can be very difficult. We have to go through things in life, and we learn to put our trust in God. We learn to grow. We learn to, to lean on Him when we can't see a way out, when we can't see any other means or, or any, any way for anything to uh, uh, work out the way that we hope it will. And sometimes God works it out in a different way from what we hope, but He works it out in a much better way. Our faith grows stronger as we lean upon God. Let me just start now by giving you a definition and nature of faith just to get us started. While faith contains knowledge, it's not just knowledge. Faith is knowledge to some degree, but it's much more than that. It also contains trust. Trust is a, a very important aspect of, of faith. Matter of fact, you could use those words simultaneously or, or synonymously. And uh, it's also not just trust, but it's acceptance. It's one thing to know something, but it's another thing to accept it, to assent to that. And, and when we accept it, we're saying we don't see the outcome. We don't know how it's going to work out, but we're going to trust in it. We're going to put our, our faith in it. We do have knowledge. We have trust, and we're going to accept it. And so all of these are required elements to demonstrate our faith in God. And as we live in life, you will run across people in everyday life that have demonstrated enormous amounts of faith. 
you will see these people. You will meet these people. Sometimes these people will not necessarily say anything to you. They may be your co-workers, and they go through adversities. They go through hardships, and they maintain a positive outlook and a good faith. And, and, and I talk to people a lot, and uh, I'll say, how are you? And they said, well, we're, we're, we're doing great through our issue. Uh, it's just by the grace of God that we've got this far. And I'm thinking, wow, what a good outlook. What a demonstration of faith because they know that they don't see the outcome, but they know that God has brought them this far. Sometimes people will say something like, well, you know, uh, I know God hasn't brought me this far to abandon me now. And so I'm just going to keep putting my faith in him and I'm going to move forward. And that is a tremendous testimony of what God is able to do in our lives and the fact that we have witnessed his uh, work in our lives, the things that he has done for us personally, is phenomenal at the things that he does. And, and oftentimes situations come in life that we don't want and they get our attention and they challenge us to demonstrate our faith. Sometimes our faith is not demonstrated for you and me. It is demonstrated for those around us to see what faith is. Maybe someone in your life that needs a demonstration of faith. Maybe someone in your life needs to see that a relationship with Christ is real, that it's not just something that we show up on Sunday and do, but it's a life that we live the rest of the week. And it, we demonstrate that in the way that we walk with Christ and believing in Him and trusting in Him. Faith is believing in what we cannot see and what we cannot understand. We walk by faith and not by sight. And that's critically important. I, I remember, uh, you know, trusting God when I surrendered to the ministry. And I'll tell you what, that was an amazing experience. When, when I finally surrendered to the ministry, and uh, I just didn't have any idea how all of that was going to plant, pan out, how it was going to work, how I was going to make a transition. But I want you to know, it was almost like I went to sleep and woke up the next day, and you're like, how did I get here? God opens doors when we trust him. God does what he does when we are obedient to him and allow him to work in our personal lives. But there are five things that faith requires, and I want to share these with you today. And, and the first is faith requires trust. There's no way around this. You cannot have faith if you do not have trust. You have to trust in things that you can't explain. You have to trust in something that you can't understand. I discovered that in life, we often demonstrate trust in many things in the course of a day. Do you know that we trust our lives with individuals? Think about this. We trust our lives and we place it in the hands of a doctor. We don't know what they're giving us to take, but we trust that they're giving us the right thing. We don't know what they're going to do, but we trust in their skill and their knowledge. We don't know how things are going to work out, but we know if we trust the doctor, then he's likely to lead us down the right path. We know that. My parents were very, uh, very uh, they were authoritative in, in nature. And they were the old school disciplinarians, and they believed in obedience. They believed in respect. And I, today it is normal for our culture. We have created a, a new norm of questioning everything and everyone. Sometimes questioning is good, but there's other times where questioning is not good. And I want you to know, if my dad told me to do something and I said, why? That was one of those times where it was not good. I just knew that my dad had my best interest in mind, and whatever he told me to do, I would do it without question because it would cause me a lot of trouble if I didn't. When my son turned 15, he got his, his driver's permit, and we were going to go to Jackson. He wanted to go to the gun and knife show. He had a little Toyota pickup, and I said, you're driving today, and he just freaked out. He didn't know what to do. How, what am I, I don't know. I've never driven there. I said, but you're going to today. And he, he was just about in tears, and he said, Dad, I don't know how to do this. I said, yes, you do. It's no different than driving on the country roads that we have around here. You just have more people around you. And this is what we're going to do, son. I asked him, do you trust me? And he said, of course I trust you. I said, well, this is what we're going to do. If I tell you to get in the left lane now, you don't question me. You get in the left lane now. If I tell you to get in the right lane now, don't question me. You get in the right lane now. Because just know, I'm riding with you, so your best interest is definitely at, at heart here. And he laughed. And I said, when I tell you the exit is a mile, I'm telling you to start getting ready. When I tell you to get over, now you get over now. Or if I tell you uh, don't get over just yet, 
then you hold until I tell you to get over, until it's time. And so we drove there. We went through no big scares or anything of that nature. I said, get in the right lane now. He got in the right lane. I said, take the exit right up here. I said, slow down because it's, it swirls around and we don't want to go flipping off the exit. And anyway, we made it there safely and he was much more confident when we went home. And so all of that came to play. The idea is this. Imagine that God is riding with us. He is, by the way. And he's telling us where to turn, how to turn, what to do, how fast to drive, per se, in life. Are we trusting him to do this? We should be. We, if my son can trust me to tell him how to drive to a gun and knife show, surely I can trust the Lord Jesus Christ to guide my life to eternity with him. Surely I can. Trust is very important. Faith requires trust and confidence in what we cannot understand or explain. When we consider the things that we put our trust in, it's really kind of uplifting, to be honest with you. We put our trust, as I mentioned earlier, we put our trust in doctors, we put our trust in medications, and think about that one for a moment. You think, we put our trust in medications. I know that some of you do because I've seen you eat a bowl of pills in the morning. I know that you put your trust in that. You can't eat breakfast because you, instead of a bowl of Cheerios, you have a bowl of pills. And so I know that you put your trust in this. You do what the doctor says, and, and you don't question it. And, and maybe we need them, maybe we don't. But, but the point is, we are trusting. We trust in, in people in general. We think, well, in our day in society, yes, if you drive an automobile, you're trusting that everyone else is going to drive the way that they are supposed to drive and stay in their lane and turn when they're supposed to turn and not uh, turn when they're not supposed to turn. We're trusting people. If you think about how chaotic it would be if no one abided by the road rules and how that would turn out, that would turn out badly, wouldn't it? But we trust that everyone is going to drive the right way. We put our trust in so many things in life. We can also put our trust in God. And, and you know, many of us probably have much more faith in God than we even realize we do have as Christians. People will say things like, I could never do what you're doing. I could never face what you're facing. Well, the truth is we may not want to face what someone else is facing, but when you have no alternative, you will see just how much faith you truly have. And it will surprise you at how much faith you have. It is an amazing thing to experience the faith in, faith in God and experience the work and deliverance of God through that faith. It's an awesome thing to experience that. We have our problems, we have our pains, God knows our lives and our sufferings, and we can trust him through them. He provides for us day in and day out. It may not always be what we want, but it's what we need. And we have to trust. In other words, we're saying that when we trust, he knows more than I do. He knows the outcome and I don't. He understands what I need at this moment. He understands how to bring good out of this. Therefore, I'm trusting in God. As a result of faith, that's what we do. We trust. And so, one requirement of faith is trust. We must trust in God. We trust that tomorrow will be just like today. Well, some days we have. We hope tomorrow is not like today. But then there are times when we trust it will be exactly like today, but tomorrow may be a little different than today. And we have to display our faith. Things happen sometimes in life. We get up and we go about our day. Today is normal. Tomorrow things go chaotic and we have to put our trust in God to get us through from one experience to another. As someone said to me, it's like taking small steps. You don't really know exactly what's going to happen, but when you look back, you see that you've taken a small step and then you've taken another one and another one and another one, and the next thing you know, you've covered a large section of ground because God has brought you as far as he could each day. And he has done for you 
what he could each day within your abilities and faith. Someone, this is nothing new with me, but I remember reading years ago about a community coming together to pray for rain. And the community came together and one little girl showed up with an umbrella and rubber boots on. I'm telling you, the little girl was serious about this thing. Nobody else did, but she did. I thought, wow, okay, maybe that's the kind of faith that we need. Maybe we need to go expecting something to happen. I've said this before. If we expect something out of church, we get something out of church. When I say that, if we expect to be blessed by the worship, by the, the, the whole experience, then we will be blessed. But if we don't expect anything, well, again, we won't be disappointed there either. When we think about faith, this whole chapter is about faith. It is about demonstrating faith. It is about the faith of the patriarchs. It talks about, uh, when we talk about, uh, in verse 4, it talks about the uh, offering of, of Abel, which was more excellent, it was a more excellent sacrifice than Cain's because it was by faith that he gave that. He didn't just give what he had. He did it by faith. When we think about Enoch, in verse 5, it says that, that Enoch walked with God. He had faith in God, and he walked with him, and he was not. It's an amazing thing. Think about Noah. Noah had never seen a boat. Noah was not a big fisherman, apparently, not a, of a boat that size. But God told Noah to build an ark, and God gave him the instructions, and Noah built an ark. But guess what the results of that was? Is that... Noah and his family was saved from the flood. Think about Abraham as it goes a little further. God called Abraham and said, I'm not telling you where to go, but get out of your homeland. Leave your home, leave everything that you've acquired behind, and you just travel, and I'll meet you on the way. What did Abraham do? He left. Think about Sarah. God promised her a child in old age. She originally didn't think it could happen, but it did. It says that she was well past her childbearing years. Think about Noah, uh, I mean, uh, Abraham later, who would offer his son as a sacrifice because God required it. God really didn't want him to sacrifice his son. He was a point to this to demonstrate what faith in God will do. By the way, he said when he got ready to plunge the knife in him, he heard some rustling in the bush and turned around and there was a ram caught. God had stopped him and he offered the ram as a sacrifice. God provided for him in all of that. I see people today live by faith and it's so encouraging because they have faith in God. I see that. people. If you go to the hospital, you'll see people living by faith. You'll see people doing the things that we need to do. I, I see people who are demonstrating their faith day in and day out. But then it also takes faith to believe in intelligent creation or design, meaning that God created the world. It takes faith to believe in that. But let me tell you this. It takes more faith to believe that there's no God than it does to believe in God. And you say, what do you mean? If you can just look at the atmosphere and figure out how a ball is floating in nothing and there's people living on that ball and it sustains them and all the gases and mixtures of everything is just right, the distance between the sun and the moon are just right, it rotates like this and then orbits around the sun and the moon. It, how, how can you not believe? When you look at the complexities of the human body, how can you not believe? When you look at a heart beating, you say, well, I, I, I know my heart's beating. I, I have a heart. I, I, have, I can feel it beating. Yes, I can feel my I've never seen it, but I know that it beats. And I know that it beats because I'm standing before you today. If it weren't beating, I wouldn't be here. And so... We demonstrate faith in God, but we can also demonstrate faith in the wrong things. Having faith and trust can be hard, and sometimes it's just hard to trust. Sometimes if we stop and think about 
the circumstances surrounding us or where we are. We stop, we, maybe we're thinking about our nation, maybe we're thinking about what's going on in the world, we're thinking about all of this, these things. Uh, it can be disheartening. It can be disheartening, but you know what? I believe, I believe that there's a purpose for this and that God's going to get the glory for it. Because I believe that what's happening right now, let me just share this with you. I believe that God is separating, did you hear me here? That he is separating the mouth professions from the heart professions of faith. I believe that we're seeing the true Christians. I believe that it's going to get a little bit stronger in what we are experiencing. I believe we're going to see more real faith and we're going to see who don't have faith. But the second fact is that faith is required for salvation. Do you know that you cannot be saved without faith? You say, but Jesus died for me. Yes, but you have to have faith to believe in that. By faith you are saved. You, you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was born of a virgin, that he was crucified for your sins and my sins, and that he was buried and resurrected on the third day, and you believe in his finished work, you trust in that, you accept it, you have the knowledge of it, you trust it and you accept it, that's called faith, then you can be saved. But you have to call upon his name, and changes come in your life as a result of that. If we consider this world, would it not be better to believe in God and find out that he's not real than to not believe in him and find out that he is real? But I want to say this to you. If you accept Jesus, there's no turning back. You won't ever want to go back. You won't ever desire the old nature. You won't ever want that again. If the Holy Spirit changes you from the inside out, all of these things that, that the world, this, the, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded this world with, the scales will fall, you will be able to see right through it. And you know what? We will be able to hit the mark. There's really a lot to be nervous about today in Christianity because there's so many different views of Christianity. But let me tell you, there's only one way to heaven. Despite what others may tell you, well, if you're good enough, I don't care how good you are. You're not going to get there because of your goodness. You'll get there because of His goodness, His grace. And you say, well, they're pretty bad, preacher. Well, the Bible doesn't say you can be too bad. The Bible says you have to be saved. And you see, when you're saved, that's what takes you from being bad to putting you in the light of, of Christ, and things in your life begin to change. So we often rank things. Well, I'm good, they're bad. I'm, I'm, you know, they, well, he was a great person. Well, she was a great person. Yes, they were bad. They were terrible. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean the way that we think it does it's about jesus there's no alternative the world will tell you there's all there's all kind of ways to heaven no there's only one road jesus said there's two ways there's a narrow gate and a wide gate and he said few is going to find that narrow gate but there's going to be a lot go through that wide gate and you see for the sake of, of of salvation what we've done as a church and i say we i'm speaking as a whole is we've done everything but preach the gospel of Christ. Now we tell everybody, you can do anything you want. God loves you. He accepts you. Yes, God does love you, but he don't accept it. God never accepts sin. You see, faith is required for salvation, and part of that means that when we accept that Christ is who he is, that he is the Son of God, what he has done was sacrifice for me so that I can receive salvation, then change comes in our life. You know, growing up, one of the things that, that I did not want to do was displease my parents. You think, well, because they would whip you? No, my parents didn't whip you. I told you before, they whooped me. It takes 15 whippings to equal one whooping, and I would get a whooping, okay? Now, I know that's not uh, good Mississippi, uh, good uh, grammar, but it's good Mississippi grammar because it has a point to it. But no, the reason I did what they said was because I respected and trusted them. And it's the same with God. We can believe in God. We can trust in God. I really don't have anything to lose by trusting in God. I really don't. Because you know what? When I die, the truth is, 
I'm going to be in the presence of Jesus right then. There's not going to be a delay in that time. And, and we think, well, I, I'm prepared for that day. Yes, but are you really prepared for that day? I've had this conversation with people more than once. It's one thing to accept Christ, and by the way, that's a, that's a tremendously good thing, but it's another thing to face your own mortality. You say, what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, the doctor says you're probably not going to make it, or you may not make it. Then it becomes real to you at that point. And let me tell you what I've witnessed through the years, what I've experienced personally and what I've witnessed in hearing those words. I've found that an enormous amount of people that I've been with during this experience that I've, I've been connected with, they have had an unwavering trust in the salvation of Jesus Christ in their life, and they were at perfect peace with it. Faith is required for salvation. But also, faith is required to please God. Now, we read this in verse 6. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. You can't please God without faith. It is an impossibility. Really, what does that mean? What is, why do we need faith in God? Let me tell you why. It says to God, first of all, that we've humbled ourselves, that we're humble, and that we trust that God knows more than we do, and we trust that he has our best interests at heart. We trust that he will never lead us astray or wrong. We trust that he will never tempt us with sin. We, we trust that he will only provide what we need in the way that we need it. But it also shows that we are dependent on God. We, it's the reason that we're called his children. Do you know what happens when children are, are living their life? Let, let me just speak very plainly today. Children do dumb things. We really do. Once we would get out of mom and dad's uh, 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 sight, you know, back in our day, and it was kind of a, a really an awesome time to come up as a child, I'll be honest with you, because um, we didn't have, I think Atari had just come out, but that was not an option for me. We didn't have all the video games. We had three channels certain times of the year. Uh, certain times we'd have five channels, depending on the weather, and turning the antenna. I was the remote, okay? Get up and turn that channel. You just, I mean, I was, I was the remote, okay? I mean, that was just the way it was. But we would go out. We, we couldn't sleep late in the summer, so we didn't take vacations. And so really getting out of school was not that big of a deal for me because, I mean, we, we weren't going to the Grand Canyon. We weren't doing all these things. We didn't go to the beach. We worked. We, we, we had huge gardens. We worked. We, it was, it, but we would get out, and in some of them, I say neighborhood, not a subdivision, a neighborhood. Our neighbors were uh, very spread out. And, and we would all get together and do things, and sometimes we would do dumb things. You want to hear one of them? We decided that water was soft, and one of my neighbors had a pond. Now, do not try this at home, okay? I'm not suggesting that anyone try this. But we set up some ramps, and we decided that we could take our bicycles and come off of the hill and hit the ramp and jump and go out into the pond, and it would be a soft landing. Let me tell you what. It didn't take but one time to figure out that water was not nearly as soft as we thought it was. And that ended our experience. We do dumb things. God says that we, his, we are his children. Now, I'm not so sure that that's always a good thing because children do dumb things. Sometimes we don't understand the effect of what we do. Sometimes we do things without thinking things through. Sometimes we don't consider the outcome of something. And so we're called his children. But just because we do dumb things doesn't mean that God will abandon us, that he will walk away from us. My mom used to patch us up regularly, <laughs> and her philosophy was if she couldn't sew it back on, you could live without it. And I'll tell you, it would have to be a serious cut before you told her because you didn't want her to clean that thing up because when she cleaned it up, it was murder. It was bad. She knew no mercy. And sometimes we do things and then we think, okay, God, take this away from me. But God says, you've got to learn a little more before we get past this. 
You've got to learn a little bit more. You see, faith pleases God, and we have to demonstrate faith in God. We have to prove that we, to ourselves, I think mainly, that we are not going to revert back to doing that, that we've learned our lesson, that we're going to trust God. But when we think about faith being required to please God, he gives us a list of, of, of patriarchs that, that trusted God, people that trusted God in dire circumstances. Think about Joseph. I mean, he, he trusted his family, his brothers. His brothers sold him into slavery. And, and he wound up being, after uh, uh, doing the right thing for his owner, he wound up being the second most powerful man in Egypt and spared the lives of many. And all of that was a divine plan to get him where he needed to be for his family. But then, let's look at the fourth thing. Faith is required to experience the will of God. God will never require you to do anything that's easy. Can I, I, I just, I, I want you to know this. You think, well, this is hard. God wouldn't ask me to do anything hard. Oh, really? It, what makes you think he won't ask you to do something hard? He told the disciples to leave their home. He sent Abraham away from his home. Let me tell you what, he sent his son to die on the cross, and we think that everything's supposed to be a bed of roses. Well, there's thorns beneath those petals. And they're tough. And so faith is required to experience and even to carry out the will of God. God's will and his plan is to work in our lives. And there's his perfect will, as we know. Everything is going to work out in his way in the end. But then there's his permissive will that allows us to use our free will to make decisions for ourselves. We have to think things through and, and move through life. We have to have faith that God is at work in our lives. Do you ever just stop and say to yourself, I know that you're at work in my life. Thank you for that. Speaking to God. Do we ever do that? Maybe sometimes we can't really see how he's at work and we say, Lord, I, I, I know you're working. I just don't know how right now. Can you... Can you give me something in my life to help sustain me, to take that small step to move on and to accomplish your will? Faith will require us 100% of the time to step into the unknown. It will require it. You will go places that you've never, ever dreamed of going and you will do things that you never, ever dreamed you would do. But that's what faith is, isn't it? That's what it is. One of the, I'm going to speak to you personally. One of the hindrances of faith in my life, my personal life, is this. Comfort. I get comfortable. I like it here. I like what I'm doing. I like my life. I like all of these things. I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying that. I like all of these things. And I, I don't really want to change, but let me tell you, you won't ever implement God's will without change. And that requires faith. It is a requirement. It's just the way it is. You see, God required Abraham to leave. God required Abraham to offer Isaac. God required uh, uh, Moses to return to Egypt. Now, he could have decl declined the offer. He tried to decline it, but I can't talk. I've got a speech impediment. I'm like, give me a break. I might stumble around with words, but I, that, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. I, I know preachers today that have a speech impediment, but when they preach, you can't hear a speech impediment. God can fix what he needs to fix when he needs to fix it. We just got to be willing to trust him. Just have faith that God is at work in your life and whatever's going on, God is going to take care of you through this. God is going to do what is necessary. But then the fifth thing, the fifth requirement of faith, faith is required to experience peace in your life. Now, I believe I can safely say that there's not a single person in this facility today or listening by the Internet that does not want peace in their life. It's what we long for. 
just give me a little peace. Just give me a, a little comfort. Just help me to get through this circumstance. Help me to get past this. It's amazing to experience peace. Jesus was asleep in a boat, Matthew chapter 8, 23 and 27, during a storm. Now, how many people sleep during storms? On water. It was, the boat was doing this, and we forget that. Jesus was asleep. I'm telling you, he must have been really tired from the physical standpoint because that sleeping on, on white capping and water is not a good thing. And his disciples woke him up and said, don't you even care about us? We're going to die and you're asleep? Do you know what Jesus said? Peace, be still. That is a definition of peace. You know what? The storm ceased raging. The wind stopped blowing. No matter what was going on around them, Christ has control. No matter what's going on in your, in your life, Christ has control, and he can give you peace and calm the storm no matter what's going on around you. He did it to demonstrate to his disciples that he could control anything. And then they wondered, what kind of man is this that even water and wind obey him? I'm like, okay, okay how long does it take you to get this? Let me remind you, he calls us his children. Sometimes I say, Calvin, how long is it going to take you to get this? And he does amazing things to give us peace. Imagine his disciples were alone later in a boat. <laughs> going across the sea and the storm began raging. They thought they were going to die. It was extraordinarily dark. And they saw Jesus walking to them on the water. How did they do that? Jesus is the light of the world. So the light came to them. And you know what happened at that moment? I, I know Peter got out of the boat. I understand all that. I realize all that. But let me tell you what happened at that moment. At that moment, Jesus didn't calm the storm immediately. At that moment, Everyone in that boat stopped focusing on the storm and they started focusing on Jesus. You see, all of a sudden, the storm was irrelevant. You see, they, they're not paying attention to the water. They're not paying attention to the wind and the waves and all of those things. They're not paying attention to the boat rocking. It's Jesus. He's, he's right here. It's Jesus. And they were so captivated by it that Peter did hop out of the boat. And as long as Peter focused on Jesus and not the storm, he walked on the water. If you focus on your problems, they'll swallow you up. But if you focus on Jesus, you'll find peace that passes all understanding. And they, they looked at him. Jesus did calm the storm. But the point of that is, look at me and not what's going on around you. Look at me. Don't focus on everything else. But then also, Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. This is his, and he's given it to us, so we should possess it. But we have a part in that. That goes back to point one. We have to trust in him. We have to trust. That's part of, that's part of what faith is about. It is a requirement to, to trust in him. But then peace is also, in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, listed in the fruit of the Spirit. I didn't say fruits. I said fruit because it's got several listed as one fruit. All of these are fruit. Part of that, that fruit, and, and it, it's peace. And I dare say that peace is something we struggle with regularly. We get discouraged. And I, as I may have said this a dozen times already in the past, but some people are habitual worriers. We don't have peace because we worry all the time. And sometimes we worry about not having something to worry about, so we come up with something to worry about. And about I, I make my own statistics up about 90% of the time, okay? So I'm going to say about 90% of the time, to stay in line with my statistics, that what we worry about never happens anyway. So why worry? Jesus said this. If it worry could add one jot or tittle to your life, why not worry? But since it won't, there's no point in it. No point in it. No, don't worry. Have peace and trust. 
don't worry. You see, Jesus will keep you in perfect peace if you have your mind steadfast and focused on him. Matter of fact, Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Wow, what a verse. That's a powerful verse. But then in Psalm 29, 11, it said, The Lord gives strength to his people, and the Lord blesses his people. Now, are you ready for this? With peace. You say, I don't know how things will work out, but I know that it will. Because I have trust in God, I also have peace that whatever happens in my life, God's going to get me through it. See, I find that we most often know the definition of faith. But we fail to see how much faith we actually have, and we have much more than we realize. I see faith in you more than you'll ever imagine. I see the things that you go through in life. I see the things that, that are occurring in your personal life. And you have such peace when you go through it. You have such faith. It's going to be okay either way. That's an amazing thing to experience that. Let me ask you today, do you have the peace of God in your life? Peace comes through trusting. It comes through having faith in Jesus for salvation. It comes in pleasing God. It comes in knowing that we are in his will. And then we experience it. Peace. We experience peace. The news can't rob you of that peace. The world cannot rob you of that peace. But you have to remember, when the storm's raging, look at Jesus, not the storm. Would you pray with me? Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share this message today. Father, there are times in life when we just really struggle with things. We don't know how we're going to get through today, how we're going to face tomorrow. But we know who holds tomorrow. And that's what's important. Today, Father, I ask you, in the blessed, precious name of Jesus Christ, that you do a work in all of our hearts and give us a peace that passes all understanding. When we can't explain it, when we can't understand it, give us peace to know that you have us in your hands and nothing will pluck us away. Sustain us, Lord, as you always do. And Father, if there's anyone in here today that needs Jesus Christ in their life, if anyone in here needs to accept you, I pray that they will do that today, that they will open their hearts and and invite you in to their life to be the Lord and Savior, to be their Lord and Savior. If there's anyone looking for a church home, if there's anyone that just needs to come and pray or kneel at the altar or sit on the front row or pray where they are, I pray that you will give them the strength to do that, but work in their lives, in all of our lives right now. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? And as you stand, I do want to invite you during this time of invitation. If you need to come and and give yourself to Jesus and and invite him into your heart for salvation, please do so. If you need to come and just say, you know what, I'm struggling in my life and and, uh, I, I just want to pray that God will give me the peace that I need. God will sustain me and carry me to the place that I need to be that he will open my eyes and help me to trust him through all of this, whatever it is you're going through, then then be obedient. Whatever your need is, God can meet it. If it's a church home, God can meet that need. Just look at Jesus today. Come as you need to come. Come. Come every soul by sin and press. If you need to come, come.
If you need to come, come. Thank all of you for being here today. We appreciate it so much for those that joined us. Uh, thank you for joining us, and if we can assist you in any way, we certainly want to do that. Our number is on the screen. Please call our office. Uh, we'll not be in the office this afternoon, but on Monday morning, and we will call you, return your call as quickly as possible. And uh, anybody else, if you need anything, uh, please do not hesitate to call. But know this, that Jesus loves you, I love you, and also that the mission field is outside of these doors. Go out and demonstrate faith to the world that you see. Let them see the peace of God ruling your life and making a difference in you. Please know, once again, that Jesus Christ loves you, and nothing will ever change that. Brother Jimmy, would you come and dismiss us in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord, for being in your house this morning and hearing this beautiful song about our merciful Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Father, for this very inspiring message that Dr. Calvin led us today about faith. And we thank you, Lord, for the times in our life where it's good and we pray for faith that we'll learn to use you every day in our seeking of your will. And we thank you, Lord, in times of bad that we'll pray for faith that you'll help get us through it. And as we leave here at Oak Hill, we pray for faith that we will just tell others and give us courage to tell them that we serve our Lord Jesus Christ and that your kingdom is coming and that they need to be ready as so as we. Now bless us now, Father, as we leave Oak Hill. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.